We are living in tremendously challenging times, and I want to thank the UN Foundation, especially Peg Willingham, for the work that you've done in arranging this, uh, and also thank all of you for coming here. I know that your time is very precious. Uh, it's an honor to have the opportunity to speak with you, and I want to share with you some of my perspectives about what really matters, what makes a difference, how we can succeed, and why it's more urgent than ever that we work together. Because this is, not just in the US, but around the world, the most challenging time for global finance since the Great Depression. Supporting global health is good for Americans' health. It's good for Americans' health because stopping epidemics and environmental and other threats to health overseas in foreign countries before they spread to our shores is not only the most ethical, but also the cheapest and the most effective way to protect Americans. Supporting global health is not only the right thing to do, but it's also the most effective way to promote stability in other countries, the most effective way to promote productivity in other countries so they can repay loans, not be dependent, buy our goods. It's also, quite frankly, the best single way to promote the reputation of this country. I will never forget the woman I met in Nigeria who had twins that she was carrying and said, please thank the American people because my babies were born without HIV because of you. No amount of money spent on anything other than health could buy that kind of respect for the American people. And it's in our interest because we promote new knowledge. Um, I am sorry to have to leave a little early. I wish I could stay here for a long time, but the last flight out of DC to Atlanta is at 10 from Dulles. Uh, and I have to be at 8 a.m. The first flight isn't uh, in time to meet at an 8 a.m. meeting with the head of the China CDC. CDC has a 30-year collaboration with China, and it's in all of our best interests. We take for granted that the number of neural tube defects in this country has plummeted. Do you know why it's plummeted? It's plummeted because 30 years ago, we started a randomized controlled trial with China that proved definitively that folate reduces the risk of neural tube defects, a very severe birth defect, and results in the fact that the rolls that you're eating are fortified with folate. And women of childbearing age have had folate levels that have soared in this country as has rates of neural tube defects plummeted. So it's in our interest. But ultimately, <clears throat> the case for global health is because it's the right thing to do. Because the US is a great country. I wish that people could come with me when I go overseas. And I see the tremendous impact of the programs that we provide on the lives of people day in and day out. It is a transformation. It is the ability to control their own lives, to control their own societies, communities, and cultures, and to live longer, healthier, more productive lives. Now, at the CDC, we have a certain basic ethos. Our basic idea is get the data and use it to improve performance. Senator Moynihan said memorably, you're entitled to your own opinions, but not to your own facts. And what we try to do at CDC is to ensure that all of us are working off the same page in terms of the facts that we look at. At CDC, we ensure that not only is data used to track what happens, but that data is used to target services to those who need the most that data is used to see if our programs are succeeding. Because if they are, we can support them with that data. We can defend them with that data. And if they're not, we need to change them. And the data will show us that. We need to ensure that also we have not only technical excellence, but managerial excellence. There's a misconception that surveillance and epidemiology is kind of over here on the side as a way of checking. Well, if you look at what works, in effective program implementation, 
It's programs that have evaluation built in to every aspect of their program, that have innovation built in to every aspect of their program. I recommend highly Bill Fagy's book just out, House on Fire. It's fascinating. It's the story of smallpox eradication in Africa and India. And many of us in public health look back on those halcyon days of the giants and we say they knew exactly what to do and they did it. But what you get from Bill's book is the sense that they didn't know what to do. But what they did know was that the right answer was always to look at the data and use the data to improve what they were doing, to figure out how to be more effective, to innovate and try new things, see if they work, and if they work, to spread them rapidly. So it's not only technical excellence, it's also excellence in management. At CDC, one of the core things we do is to strengthen in-country staff and institutions. So we've helped train 2,000 epidemiologists, people who've gone through programs the equivalent of the Epidemic Intelligence Service in the US, and they're leading programs all over the world in disease control and communicable disease control, environmental disease control, outbreak investigations, non-communicable diseases. They're the next generation of people all around the world who will figure out how to detect and respond to the leading problems of their day. Effective evaluation, effective data is integral to effective program management. Um, I also think that CDC has a core value of technical collaboration. Our counterpart in countries around the world is the Ministry of Health. I was privileged to work for more than five years in India embedded with the Ministry of Health. And India has treated 14 million people for tuberculosis with the best available treatment and saved 2.5 million lives in the past 15 years because of the program that we established with support from WHO, from the World Bank, and with tremendous strengths from the government of India and the states of India. So that technical collaboration is very important and I want to really salute the UN Foundation because the work that the UN does is so crucial to progress. I was embedded for five years with the World Health Organization in India. I could go to the Ministry of Health every day from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. and help them get the job done. And we have 2,000 staff in 40 countries doing that right now all over the world. And we appreciate the partnerships that all of you have and the support that all of you provide to do that. Now, I want to talk about four areas, and I really want to hear what you have to say and to have uh, a dialogue. The first is on immunization, and I want to congratulate the UN Foundation for Shot at Life. It's a fantastic initiative that should make a huge difference. Immunizations are the best buy in public health. We've looked at this data recently in the US. Every year, the US healthcare system saves $13 billion net, not gross, net because of vaccination. US society saves $70 billion every year because of vaccines. And globally, we save millions of lives. Two and a half million kids didn't die this year because of vaccines. Vaccines are a fantastic, fantastic innovation, and yet we have so far to go. Polio, we need all of our creativity. We need all of our commitment. We need to get over the finish line in polio. And it's not going to be easy because polio is the ultimate in equity. Disease eradication is the ultimate in sustainability. Once it's gone, it's gone forever. Once it's gone, it's gone for everyone. The US saves millions, billions of dollars because of smallpox eradication because we don't have to get vaccinated anymore. And the same will happen in the future in, in polio, but we have to get over the finish line and we will fail if we don't intensify what we're doing today. Measles, four million kids didn't die in the past decade because of supplemental measles vaccination initiatives. 12.7 million kids didn't die overall because of measles vaccination. It is one of the most successful child survival programs ever in the world. And yet, we've had outbreaks in more than 30 countries since 2009, we're falling behind. 
rubella, and John has been pushing me on this for years. Gavi today said they're going to open a window for rubella. This is a great success. Let me tell you, we need to do a good job at increasing vaccination programs, and we need to get over the finish line in polio. We need to make more progress in measles. We have more progress in rubella that we can make, and we have new vaccines that are crucially important. 20% of all child deaths in the world in 2008 were from vaccine-preventable diseases. Hib, uh, Haemophilus influenza, uh, pneumococcal, rotavirus vaccines. We need to get those out there. It's disgraceful that we have them and we're not using them. How can it be that our children have the chance to grow up healthy and strong, and children who are at much higher risk of getting desperately ill or dying from pneumonia or diarrhea don't have access to those vaccines. Someone reminded me today that I gave a talk last year about the pneumonia vaccine. And I told the following story, which is quite true. Uh, when I was um, uh, in New York City as TB controller and uh, my now older son uh, was four months old, I walked in from work and my wife had Michael in her arms, and as I walked in the door, I thought he was dead. He had pneumonia. He was bacteremic with, with a, a pneumococcal pneumonia. Blood cultures were all positive. He was barely breathing. He had a sky-high fever. Uh, we were able to cure him with routine antibiotics. But at four months old, um, there was not a lot we could have done that we didn't already do. And kids today all over the world are dying from diseases that could be prevented with a vaccine that shouldn't cost very much. So we have tremendous success in um, vaccine preventable diseases, but still much further to go. Malaria. I'm so excited about the new vaccine. We have the potential to do more with this, but it's a start. We don't know the exact role, the new vaccine trial that CDC was able to participate in. We have a fantastic demographic surveillance site in Kenya, 200,000 people under continuous monitoring. It's a great test bed for any intervention, cook stoves, malaria vaccines, bed nets, uh, circumcision. This is the kind of data that's so important to figure out where we should invest our money. We're never going to have as much money as we need. And so we need to make sure that every dollar we have goes as far as it can possibly go. And in malaria, we've shown 20, 30 percent reductions in all-cause malaria mortality. I'm sorry, all-cause childhood mortality just from malaria treatment. And a freeing up of blood supplies, 25, 50 percent of all blood used in some communities is for kids and others with malaria. If that blood's available, then women who are hemorrhaging and bleeding to death in childbirth will have blood available and will survive. Their kids will grow up healthier. The next generation will be healthier. So I think we have great promise in malaria uh, prevention and control. It's a great success story. And it's one of those things that countries recognize almost immediately. The President's Malaria Initiative run by USAID has had a dramatic impact on the course of malaria. But we know that the key lesson in malaria is the need for persistence. If we let up, it will come right back. We don't yet have a cure. We don't yet have a vaccine. We don't yet have a way of eradicating it. But we have a way of controlling it and of reducing the number of illnesses and deaths. HIV. Let no one forget what a terrible problem HIV is. More Americans have died from HIV than died in every war since the Civil War in this country. 25 million people around the world have been killed by HIV. 33 million people are still living with HIV, but we have real hope. The number of people dying from HIV has fallen by one-third in the last decade. The number of new infections have, has fallen by more than half after being stagnant for a long time. And we now know what works in HIV. We don't have a cure. We don't have a vaccine. But we know that circumcision can reduce the risk of infection by at least 60 percent. And Kenya has circumcised more than 70 percent of the people in need. Other countries are lagging far behind that. 
We know that we can prevent virtually all mother-to-child transmission, and Botswana has done that. Their rates of maternal-to-child transmission are not much higher than the rates here in the U.S. And we now know, because of prevention trial 052, that treating HIV is preventing HIV. For 30 years, we've had a, 25 years, we've had a fight. Treatment versus prevention, what's more important? Now we know that treatment is prevention, that treatment is essential to prevention, and we can work together to optimize the dollars that we spend, the programs that we run to change the world. PEPFAR is a remarkable success, and we need to all work together to protect it. 3.8 million people today are alive, walking around, teaching, learning, raising kids because of PEPFAR. They would be dead or dying otherwise. Last year, 114,000 kids were born without HIV because of PEPFAR. And PEPFAR is not only meeting its targets and coming in under budget, but it's also strengthening health systems, laboratories, epidemiologists, maternal mortality, cesarean sections. These are all things that can be scaled up because of PEPFAR. And it's a wonderful example of all of the US government saying, we're going to work together. We're going to identify the comparative advantages and deploy them in the interest of global health. Why? Because that's the best thing to do. Why? Because that's how we can make every dollar that we spend go as far as it can possibly go. Why? Because that's how we can save the most lives. Why? Because that's our responsibility to the American taxpayer. Because every dollar that we spend comes out of their pocket. And we need to go back to that commitment to make sure that we're diligent stewards of public dollars. These aren't our dollars. These are taxpayer dollars. And we need to make sure that every single dollar is spent as well as possible. I also am so proud to be part of the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, led by the UN Foundation. Uh, the interim goal is 100 million homes with cleaner and more efficient stoves. This is a challenge, and I don't want to pull any punches about it. Um, more than 3 billion people around the world rely on dirty fuel sources. And I've got to say, I was wrong on this one. When Kirk Smith came to India, and I was there, and he showed that there was a big increase in TB in families that use cook stoves, I said, it's residual confounding, which for those of you who do epidemiology know, basically it's because you didn't correct it well enough for all of the other factors that might have been. But I was wrong. Um, indoor air pollution is a huge, huge problem, not only for individual health, but for women's safety, going to remote areas to collect wood and other things, for deforestation. And uh, if you haven't seen the pictures of uh, the Dominican Republic uh, versus Haiti from a satellite view, it's heartrending. This is a country that has basically depilated their entire environment. And cook stoves can be a big part of the solution, but we have to make sure that cook stoves aren't uh, what's been described before as a solution that has great potential and always will. We need to make sure that it becomes a reality for women and children and families all around the world. And CDC can help with that by helping to evaluate what really works with cook stoves? What will, really works to help people adopt them? What's the real impact? Because what we know is, the studies show it ain't so easy. Uh, I remember walking through a slum of Delhi with a tuberculosis control officer in a kind of a peripheral part, and I noticed in this household that we were uh, in that there was an improved cook stove and there was also a dung stove. And so I asked the family, why do you have both? And they said, because the chapatis really taste better. <laughs> on the dung stove. And the physician in charge of tuberculosis, the woman in charge of the whole area for TB said to me, they really do. <laughs> so we have real challenges. Uh, but together, we can do a lot. And I want to really thank all of you for everything you do uh, day in, day out, and to urge you to do even more to defend global health, to expand our commitment to global health, because it is the best thing for this country. It is our best investment in terms of not only what's best for Americans, but what's best for the world. We have to make sure that every dollar we spend is well spent. We also have to make sure that we preserve and protect the dollars that we have going. 
and that we explain to people on the Hill, to people uh, in communities, to people in the faith-based communities, that this is one of the things that makes us great as a nation. This is one of the things that makes us proud to be Americans. I wish that Americans could come with me when I go around the world and see what happens to families that grow up healthy because they've been vaccinated. Clean water, clean air, clean food. This is a birthright of every person around the world. And I really thank the UN Foundation for the convening and the advocacy and the creativity that they bring to the challenge of making sure that the work that the CDC does and the work that all of the US government does and the work that multinational agencies do can have the biggest possible impact at reducing early death, at improving healthy life, and ensuring that we have lower health care costs, more economic productivity, more stability, and fundamentally, better quality of life for people, not just in this country, because it's in our own self-interest, but around the world. So thank you all very much.